You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke. And just as a reminder, you are either listening to this show on bostonfreeradio.com, watching me on Somerville Community Access TV, that is SCATV, and or watching me on Facebook Live, either on my personal page or on the Boston Free Radio page. Either way you could watch me, I'm glad you could join me. So I've got five new movies to review for you for this show. First, though, let's get into my segment, What's Topping the Box Office? The Top 10 Highest Grossing Movies of This Past Weekend. I used to say box office winners, but those movies that are in the top 10 are not necessarily winners or are not necessarily financially successful. However... The first movie, or rather the first movie I'll mention that's number one at the box office is most definitely a winner. The Fate of the Furious, number one at the box office for the third week in a row. This weekend it grossed $19.9 million. Against a budget of $250 million, The Fate of the Furious has so far grossed $193.3 million here in the States and one. million point oh six seven billion dollars worldwide so while it's not a hit yet here in the states it is most certainly certified around the world and it's amazing it grossed more than a billion dollars in just three weeks it took beauty and the beast about five weeks to make that much so i can't say why that that trend is how it is but there you go number two of the box office is a big surprise to me it is the number two it is the number one highest grossing debut movie of the week, but it surprises me because I haven't heard very much about this movie other than seeing a few posters for it. The movie is How to Be a, a Latin Lover, and the movie has a few famous people in it like Salma Hayek, but the lead actor in the movie is nobody who's famous, at least in the Western world. But How to Be a Latin Lover grossed $12.3 million this past weekend, and I don't have any information on its budget or how much it grossed internationally. Maybe I'll have that um, information next week, but as for right now, I can't say whether it's a hit, a flop. I really can't say, but it's off to a really great start. The number three movie at the box office this weekend is also a big surprise because I have never heard of this movie, period. The movie is called Bahu Bale 2, the conclusion. So not only did I not know that this, there was a Bahu Bali 1, which apparently there is, it was made last year, but this Indian film, I never even heard of it. So it's surprising to me that it's number three at the box office and the number two highest grossing debut movie. This weekend it made $10.4 million just in the United States on a $39 million budget. Around the world, including in the United States, it has so far made $97.4 million. So I'm not sure if being a hit in the U.S. counts for Bahubali, but around the world, it's already a certified hit. So good for that movie, even though I've never heard of it and probably will not see it. The Boss Baby slid from number two last week to number four this week, having grossed $9.4 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $125 million, The Boss Baby has so far made $148.8 million here in the States and $399.2 million around the world, making it a tentative hit here in the States, but a certified hit around the world. The movie I thought would at least be number two is actually number five at the box office this weekend that is the circle which despite the star power of emma watson and tom hanks did not overpower any of the other films i just mentioned it only made nine million dollars this weekend but that's against a budget of 18 million dollars so the circle is not a hit yet here in the states but it might be by next week of course we'll have to see i don't have the international numbers for you for this movie Beauty and the Beast, the other Emma Watson movie, is number six in the box office this weekend in its seventh week in release, having grossed just $6.8 million this past weekend. But against a budget of $160 million, Beauty and the Beast has made $480.5 million here in the States and $1.143 billion around the world, which makes it a certified hit here in the States and around the world.
Going in Style is a movie that in its four weeks in release never cracked the top five, but for its budget, it's actually doing pretty well. It's number seven at the box office this week in, weekend, having grossed $3.6 million. Against a budget of $25 million, Going in Style has so far grossed $37.3 million here in the States and $61.5 million around the world. So that makes it a tentative hit here in the States, but it might just eke its way to being a certified hit here in the States. But around the world, it is already certified, surprisingly enough. Not making, again, the amount of money or even a fraction of the amount of money that The Fate of the Furious or... Beauty and the Beast is made, or at least not a big fraction of that, but still, it's earned a lot of its money back, so good for that movie. Smurfs The Lost Village is number 8 at the box office this weekend, having slid from number 5 last week and grossing $3.6 million. Mi- $3.6 million this weekend. Against a budget of $60 million, Smurfs The Lost Village has so far grossed $38 million here in the States and $155.5 million around the world. So it's a bit of a box office disappointment here in the States, but around the world, it's grossed more than twice its money back, making it a certified hit around the world, but not a hit yet here in the States, surprisingly. And another movie that's kind of been bubbling beneath the surface here in the States and probably even around the world is the movie Gifted, which is open in a few select theaters, but is still doing well enough to crack the top 10, which it has in its three of its four weeks it's been released. Gifted has grossed $3.4 million dollars in U.S. theaters this weekend. Against a budget of just $7 million, Gifted has so far grossed $15.9 million here in the States and $16.5 million around the world. So unlike the aforementioned The Fate of the Furious and Beauty and the Beast, Gifted is not breaking any box office records, but it wasn't expected to do so. But it already is a certified hit here in the States and around the world. And finally, number 10 of the box office this weekend is a movie that you're probably not going to see in the top 10 next week. Unforgettable, which is a movie, by the way, I gave my rating of a flunk out to. And I'm not saying that other people heard my review. They probably just received bad word of mouth and not just from me. But this weekend, Unforgettable grossed $2.4 million. Against a budget of $12 million, though, Unforgettable has so far grossed $9.2 million here in the States and $12.1 million around the world, which makes it a tentative hit around the world, but here in the States, it's not doing so well. My new dad threw a barbecue. I burnt everything. Ah! And then we played catch. I broke Mr. Lewis's window. And then, somehow, my hand. My hand! And then my dad even let me drive his car. The hospital's on the right! It was a rough day. It was a great day. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. For more information on how you can adopt, visit AdoptUSKids.org. A public service announcement from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt US Kids, and the Ad Council. Welcome to Mr. Bear's Violet Hour Saloon, where the sky is evening gorgeous, the drinks won't cloud your head, and the cocktail nuts are poems. Join me, Mr. Bear, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Boston time on bostonfreeradio.com for music, poetry, fiction, interviews, and more. Making the lonely a little more bearable. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. And I, again, am your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you for this show is The Circle. This is the latest movie starring Emma Watson, Tom Hanks, John Boyega, Patton Oswalt, and many other actors. It is directed by James Ponsold with a screenplay written by Ponsold and David Eggers whose book, The Circle, is the basis for this movie. Now, James Ponsold is a relatively young director. He's only uh, 39 years old. And the movies he's directed before this have actually included The End of the Tour, which is one of the one of 2015's most underrated movies, for which I'm very surprised Jason Segel didn't receive an Oscar nomination, but just moving on. He also directed Smashed, which is a movie from 2012, which starred Aaron Paul, and The Spectacular Now, which is a movie he directed that... I think is based on a Judy Bloom book. book. I might be wrong about that. But she actually um, 
but the movie actually stars Shailene Woodley. And let's see, is there any other... Uh, th- there's no other films of note that he directed, but The Circle is his latest. And what is The Circle about? The Circle is about a young 24-year-old woman named May who lands a dream job at a powerful tech company in Silicon Valley called The Circle. And once she lands this job, it seems to be an ideal place and with ideal co-workers, but she sooner or later uncovers a nefarious agenda that will affect the lives of her friends, family, and ultimately, that of humanity. And that is a good synopsis of the film, and it's also a really good synopsis of the book, which I've read, by the way, and I recommend the book highly. And the reason I'm recommending the book is not only because it's a really good read, because it is, but it is also far better than the movie, and the movie had the possibility, it almost had that ambition, or it should have had that ambition of being a movie of this generation of millennials where everybody's on their smartphones and social media is is supreme, but unfortunately, it doesn't meet those expectations. It's a it's a relatively low budget movie of only 18 million. And what I wanted to respect about the film was that it's actually not released by any major movie studios like Universal, Paramount, Disney, the list goes on. You actually see in the very beginning a number of small independent movie studios who collaborated to make this film happen. And when I saw this, I thought to myself, okay, this is a bunch of small studios who aren't under the influence of major Hollywood studios, so they're not maybe intimidated by Silicon Valley powerhouses like Google or Facebook to make them look bad. This might lead to something interesting. Unfortunately, it doesn't. It's a movie that overall had the chance to be ambitious, but overall felt flat. I do think that Tom Hanks probably gave the best performance of this movie as one of the founders of The Circle, and his character's name, if you'll just bear with me for a moment, is Bailey, or his his full name is given in the book, Eamon Bailey. And Eamon Bailey is kind of like Steve Jobs, except older, I think, uh, comparatively, when you consider when the... when the company was founded and how he wasn't the only founder. But he's like Steve Jobs in the sense that he's enthusiastic about futuristic technology, very gadget-heavy, and probably even more importantly, he is very charismatic. So it's because of that charisma that you wouldn't think he's the villain of the movie, but he is. And I do think that Tom Hanks had probably one of the more multi-layered performances in this movie, and his... job acting in this film is not bad. In fact, I thought for what the character of Eamon Bailey was, Tom Hanks was perfectly cast. I would have thought that Emma Watson was perfectly cast. After all, she's about the age of the protagonist in the original book, and she's she's overall, she's a, a competent actress, you would think. But in this movie, she delivers a very shall we say, flat performance, something that's very uninspired, not particularly as emotion-driven as you think she would be. And overall, unfortunately, with the exception of Tom Hanks, everyone else, or just about everyone else in the film, or at least the ones who work in this company called The Circle, also give very flat performances. This is a movie that could have been a satirical critique on our social media culture, especially YouTube and Facebook and how a lot of people go about their daily lives documenting everything on video. I personally don't document everything on video. I do document this show, which you should watch, and I really hope that uh, you are enjoying what you're watching, or at least uh, in with the conversation. I, I can always hope that, but unfortunately, the movie did not achieve what the book did. It's also worth it to note this. The Circle is a movie that's only one hour and 50 minutes long, and it's based on a book that in its paperback form is 450 pages. So one hour and 50 minutes compared to 
a book that's 450 pages. Okay, think about that. Now, the book The Godfather, written by Mario Puzo, was about 300 pages and change. But that became a three-hour movie. So I feel like The Circle was a movie that was constrained by its time. And if it was interesting enough, I think it could have gone on for three, three and a half hours, and I would have been transfixed. To paraphrase Roger Ebert, no great movie is ever long enough, and no bad movie is ever short enough. Unfortunately, one of the problems with this movie only being $18 million is the fact that you see very little of the Silicon Valley campus that is the circle. In fact, there's one scene where an acquaintance of Emma Watson's character, whose name is Annie, who also is more of a veteran for the the circle, is pointing places to her like here's the trampoline, here's the gym, here's, you know, the the sta- the main stage, this and that. But you only see her pointing to things. You don't actually see what she's pointing at. It's it's telling and not showing. And I feel like the campus of the circle should have been a character, and unfortunately that opportunity was blown. So there is a lot that's left to be desired in the circle. It's a major disappointment, especially if you read the book, and it gets my rating of a high, but still a flunk out. Today, my new dad and I shot off a rocket in the park. Today, my new son and I failed to shoot off a rocket. The rocket launched into the air. And then crashed into the pond. I'll never forget that day. I'll never forget that day, even if I tried. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. For more information on how you can adopt, visit AdoptUSKids.org. A public service announcement from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt US Kids, and the Ad Council. <laughs> Never Stop the Madness, Tuesdays at 9 p.m., bostonfreeradio.com. Welcome back to the show Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Norman. Norman is the latest movie written and directed by Joseph Cedar and stars Richard Gere, Michael Sheen, Steve Buscemi, and a number of other noteworthy actors. Joseph Cedar, for those of you who don't know, is an act- is a, excuse me, a director who has directed several uh, independent movies of date uh, to date, but none I actually have seen. To be honest with you, it, Norman is actually his most recent film since Footnote, and uh, which was which was released in 2011. And I can't really tell you very much more than that. So this is my introduction to Joseph Cedar, and the movie Norman has the complete original title of Norman: colon, The Moderate Rise and Tragic Fall of a New York Fixer. So I'm somebody who doesn't watch movie previews, but of course, going to the movies as often as I do, I can't help but look at the posters. But as I was looking at the poster of Norman, I was thinking to my, and I read the sentence, The Moderate Rise and a Tragic Fall of a New York Fixer. I wasn't exactly sure, and I'm still not exactly sure, what a fixer is. Is that just a figure of speech of somebody who makes connections and uh, m- makes deals with other people. It's kind of a, it's a vague term. And I'm not sure if it's because I don't live in New York, but I'm not exactly sure what a fixer is. But the fixer in question in this movie is Norman. His name is Norman Oppenheimer. And he's a small-time operator, another vague term, who befriends a young politician at a low point in his life. Three, cut to three years later, the politician becomes an influential world leader, and Norman's life dramatically changes for better or worse. Let me get into a little bit more specifics here. The movie takes place and is filmed in New York City, and it has some great on-location shots. And you also get a performance by Richard Gere that's very much unlike any other, just about any other performance that Richard Gere has, has had. In every movie that Richard Gere has been in, from American Gigolo to, let's say, his most recent, well, whatever his most recent was before this movie, but the only movie I can think of that's that's most recent to my memory is Chicago. 
<laughs> Richard Gere is not particularly a confident guy, or at least he doesn't carry himself as confidently as he does in most of the other movies he's been in, but definitely the ones I've I've mentioned previously. He's a guy who goes around wearing um, glasses, uh, a hat, and a very uh, thick fall coat. And he, he certainly hides behind a, a certain... <laughs> I just lost the word there. A, a, a certain... Wardrobe. No, let, let me just say that. And the politician he befriends is an Israeli digni dignitary whose name is Eshel, who's played very well in this movie by an actor named Lior Ashkenazi. Or at least I hope that's how his name is pronounced. So this Israeli dignitary comes to New York City, and Norman befriends him and decides to impress the man by buying him some very expensive shoes. And I'm not exactly sure how Norman Oppenheimer gets the money he does. In fact, you you don't really see very much of Norman Oppenheimer other than him going around from place to place and doing his deals either on on pay phones on his own smartphone or even walking into an office supply store like staples and doing his business deals there but he's well known enough so that several people in several new york social class circles know exactly who he is and know his first and last name there is a rabbi in this movie who's played by steve buscemi who i don't actually think is jewish so that's an interesting casting choice but not an unwelcome one who apparently knows norman as does his nephew in this movie is played by michael sheen who's a little bit higher up in the new york establishment and the thing about Norman Oppenheimer is that he is very persistent, he's very tenacious, which is admirable, but you can also tell how pushy he is and how he gets on the nerves of just about everyone who he's trying to make deals with. The problem I found with this movie was I couldn't really follow the plot particularly well. I, I guess part of the point of this movie is that Norman kind of hides behind his glasses and his hat. He's not a meek person. He certainly is tenacious, as I said, but he's also somebody who's a mystery. You, you don't see him usually going home anywhere. In fact, I began to think for a moment there that he was homeless, but then again, he's a little bit too clean to be homeless. So it's kind of interesting how there's that bit of mystery to Norman Oppenheimer. But at the same time, I didn't, I felt like I knew too little about the character. And I found it fascinating that he was doing these, these deals with various people in various social circles. Not only was he trying to save a synagogue in, in one scene, but he's also trying to get an Israeli dignitary's son into Harvard as an undergraduate, although if you're an Israeli dignitary, I don't know why you'd rely on somebody who doesn't even live in Boston to get your son into Harvard, Not, let alone basically even trust the guy. But there were parts where the plot of the movie confused me a little bit, but I did really enjoy Richard Gere's performance. I thought it was multi-layered. I thought it left maybe a little bit too much mystery at times, but enough, definitely enough mystery to keep Richard Gere's character intriguing. And I do think it's a testament to Richard Gere's acting that in this movie he plays somebody who is definitely a lot less confident, at least outwardly, than other characters he's played before, but he plays that lack of confidence particularly well, which you can't say for other actors like Tom Cruise or Leonardo DiCaprio. So cheers to Richard Gere for playing a, a, a different character than what he's normally used to playing. I also liked other actors in this movie like Steve Buscemi, Charlotte Gainsbourg, and definitely a standout performance by Lior Ashkenazi, and pardon me if I mispronounce that name, but the movie Norman gets my rating of a checkout because even though the performances in this movie were strong, I found myself definitely being confused by the plot. Certainly, there were moments of this movie that dragged. And by the end, I began to think, what? I, I did, still didn't know exactly what a fixer was. And I think it's important that I did. I'm Paul George of the Indiana Pacers. 
When I was six, my days were spent playing basketball. When I was six, my dream was to make it to the NBA. When I was six, my mom had a stroke. So I want you to learn to spot a stroke fast. F-A-S-T. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. I'm Paul George. Spot a stroke fast. Visit strokeassociation.org. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association and the Ad Council. These are not just academic exercises. A world run by a handful of greedy bankers can't possibly last. The only solution is to fight. I'm going to tell you a number of things, but you really only have to remember two words. Governments lie. New England Unsettler. Mondays at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, right here on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pic... Excuse me. Worst time to hiccup. Let me say that again. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. You are either listening to me on bostonfreeradio.com, watching me on Scat V, or watching me on my Facebook Live groups, either on my own personal page or on the Boston Free Radio page. Either way you could join me, I'm glad you could. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is a horror film called The Void. This has been playing at a lot of independent film festivals, including one I was recently at, called the Boston Underground Film Festival, or Buff for short. And it is a supernatural horror movie about a number of people who are trapped in a hospital while bizarre circumstances are going on outside that prevent them from leaving. That's just the basics of the plot. Shortly after delivering a patient to an understaffed hospital, a police officer, a local sheriff, experiences strange and violent occurrences seemingly linked to the group of mysterious hooded figures outside the hospital that's keeping everyone inside that understaffed hospital from leaving or seeking help. It's a movie that certainly starts out very well, or at least intriguingly, and it is certainly very creepy throughout. In fact, the mysterious hooded figures outside this understaffed hospital look like a cross between the Illuminati and the KKK. And once the the sheriff in this movie is played by a relatively unknown actor named Aaron Poole, begins to uh, confront these hooded figures, Eventually, he wishes he hadn't. And why he wishes he hadn't, I can't quite get into that because I'm very cautious about revealing spoilers. But man, it's it's hard for me to do a seven and a half minute segment on a movie and not get into the plot details. But I just gave you pretty much everything about it without spoiling anything. I will tell you that this is a joint directorial effort by Jeremy Gillespie and Stephen Kostansky, and there's nobody particularly famous who's in the movie. Uh, Jeremy Kostansky has been uh, involved in a number of movies over the last uh, decade or so. He was actually in the art department for a number of big movies, including Suicide Squad, which was not everybody's cup of tea, but certainly you have to admire the art in that film. The remake of Total Recall, the remake of Robocop, and Pacific Rim, amongst other people, amongst, amongst other movies, excuse me. Stephen Kostansky is also, uh, has also been involved in a number of films in the makeup department. Such as, especially, believe it or not, he was also involved in Suicide Squad. He was also in the makeup department for Crimson Peak, which is a movie that came out two years ago. It was a supernatural horror film directed by Guillermo del Toro. And while the movie had some problems story-wise, it certainly had some great makeup. So I believe that The Void is the first directorial effort of both Stephen Kostansky and Jeremy Gillespie. Let me just uh, verify that as I'm talking to you. Actually, I stand corrected. Sorry. There have been a number of other films that the two of them have directed together, including one from 2011 called Father's Day and and another one from 2011 called Manborg. Other than that, it's been mostly short films, and so this is probably their biggest movie to date. 
But it's a really good mashup of horror, sci-fi, and certainly some supernatural elements. And it's a movie that is very similar to a lot of Agatha Christie stories in the sense that you have a number of people trapped in one area, and it's it, not only are they trying to figure out what the, the strange things are going on outside, but they're also there also might be somebody in the inside who might be in on it. And also, <laughs> and also, let's see, I, I guess there are some certain, there are strong performances in this movie. I thought Aaron Poole as Daniel Carter made a good leading man. He was certainly somebody who has a, a past in this town. His, his father was a sheriff before him and his, his past history plays some role in in certain plot developments that go on here. There's also a good performance here by a young nurse, I think it is, either a nurse or a resident, whose name is Allison Frazier, or Fraser, I should say. And she is played by a relatively lesser-known actress named Kathleen Monroe, but she's also probably one of the more relatable people in this movie, there's also a young medical student named Kim, who's played by Ellen Wong, who at first is not particularly enthusiastic about working at a small hospital, but eventually finds that she's going to have to help somebody give birth to a child. So a lot of great plot elements here, and I've got an hour and 45 minutes to, t to speak more about this movie. But I will tell you that while it has been playing in a lot of independent film festivals, especially the one I just mentioned, the Boston Underground Film Festival. You can watch it now on Amazon Video. You can rent it for three ninety nine, dollars which isn't too bad. And I do think it's worth seeing. If you don't like horror, I probably recommend you stay away from this movie, but there are several shocking moments in this film. There are also some surprisingly funny moments in this film. I think the acting is really great. The plot certainly sucks you in, and The Void is very reminiscent of a number of sort of sci-fi horror films from the early to mid-'80s. And it certainly has, especially on the poster, a, a slight tribute to those kinds of movies. And it's probably one of the best horror films I've seen of this year. And I love it when a movie, especially a horror film with a lower with a with a low budget I'm trying to think of another terminology besides blow my mind, but I like it when it surprises me. I like it when it shocks me. And certainly the void had a really good story. Great performances by just about everyone involved, none of whom you would know from no household names in this film, but that's perfectly fine. The Void gets my rating of a knockout. I think it's a movie that's great to see at a midnight showing at your local independent theater. I actually saw it at a local film, a midnight showing at the Coolidge Corner Theater, and I not only enjoyed myself immensely, it also kept me awake in a good way. When I was little, I didn't talk for a long time. I was sensitive to lights and sounds, so I built secret hiding places where they couldn't get in. Sometimes, I did the same things over and over, until one day, I found out I had autism. My family got me help. Slowly, I learned how to live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at AutismSpeaks.org slash signs. Brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. You want free speech? I got your free speech right here. It's all about free speech, baby. BostonFreeRadio.com Snacks and treats, brother. Snacks and treats. Snacks and treats. My name is Matt Rocha. Hashtag. Hashtag. Snacks and treats. <laughs> Snacks and treats, man. I'm getting behind it, man. You're behind it? I think it sounds good. Especially when you say it. Snacks and treats. <laughs> <laughs> I want some right. snacks and treats. Snacks and treats. Thursdays at 9 o'clock on BostonFreeRadio.com. <laughs> <laughs> Two chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> <laughs>
Should have just been one. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is another horror film called The Devil's Candy. This is a, another one that's independent and is directed and written by Sean Byrne. And Sean Byrne is a director from Tasmania. Uh, Australia, and he's directed a number of short films. This is his second feature, though. His first one from 2009 is one called The Loved Ones, which I haven't seen, but that film alone won a number of awards at film festivals, including the People's Choice Award at uh, in the Midnight Mattis category at the Toronto International Film Festival. As for The Devil's Candy, I it's won... One award for best film score at the Gerard Mir Film Festival, which I have never heard of, but I'd like to check that one. I'd like to check that film festival out if it's close enough, but I don't know if this movie's going to win any more awards. Certainly not Oscars, but it's a horror film that is actually a lot of fun to watch. And I, I say actually as if horror films aren't fun to watch, but some. Some horror films are terrible, but, you know, horror films are usually hit or miss. But this one certainly hits. And I like that any other writer or director probably would have taken less of an artistic liberty with the victims in this movie. But here, the, the victims were probably my favorite part. Not what happened to them, but just how they were as characters. So The Devil's Candy is about a struggling painter who, has, who is married and has a kid who is possessed by satanic forces after he and his young family move into their dream home in rural Texas in this creepy haunted house tale. So the previous occupant of this quote-unquote dream home, which turns out to be haunted, is a morbidly obese man named Ray Smiley, and he's played in this movie by Pruitt Taylor Vince. And I really hate it when I have to describe on the radio what certain actors look like and just... You'll have to take my word that you don't know him by name, but you've definitely seen him in a lot of other films. But trust me, you've seen this guy in other films. But you're introduced to this character as he's trying to get some sleep, but he keeps hearing these creepy whispering voices in his head. And in probably one of the best ways in any movie to get rid of creepy voices that are going on in his head, what this guy does is nothing drastic like suicide, but he actually plugs in an electric guitar, and just starts strumming it. And of, since it's connected to an amplifier, he, you basically just keep seeing him go, rawr, rawr. and I thought to myself, that would drive me nuts if I had that problem and an electric guitar was my only solution. No, not because it wouldn't look awesome, because it would, but I'm a guy who loves my sleep. But... I gotta, I gotta say, for a psychotic guy to, to handle satanic voices in his head that way is really rich. I, I love that part of the movie. But eventually the guy moves out, or I think he at least commits himself, and judging from when you see him in the movie, who could blame him? And in comes the struggling painter, whose name is Jesse Hellman, and he's played by a very unrecognizable Ethan Embry. And Ethan Embry is a guy who, when he first started acting in the 90s, he usually got a lot of roles as a wimpy kid. He was in... The movie Can't Hardly Wait as a wimpy kid who is pining over Jennifer Love Hewitt. And, you, and if you've seen the movie, you know exactly what I'm talking about. He also played similar roles in movies like Empire Records and That Thing You Do. Here, he's, he's got long hair, he's got a beard, and he's usually he's a big heavy metal fan, so he's usually wearing shirts by the likes of Metallica or Slayer. And just... From that whole getup alone, I did not recognize him from his other movies like Can't Hardly Wait. But I was also really impressed because, man, he's, he's a metal guy now. But what I also really liked about his character was that usually the victims in horror movies are either these very straight-laced people and or they are people who just don't believe in ghosts or are very skeptical. 
In this case, you have a guy who has been listening to a lot of this heavy, heavy metal music, but it's part of his character. What I also liked about him is he's going on these road trips with his family, who consists of his wife, Astrid, who's played by Sh- Shiri Appleby, and his precocious daughter, Zoe, who's played in this movie by a newcomer who I really liked named Kiara Glasgow. And I liked how they were driving together and they were blasting this heavy metal music. Of course, the wife, as you would expect, was kind of rolling her eyes, but the uh, the father and the daughter were getting really into it. And you rarely see those characters in a lot of films let alone in horror films. But that's what I really liked about it. But the painting aspect, or rather him, um, Jesse being a struggling painter, comes into the, the, the plot of the movie and welcomes itself when Jesse starts painting these mur- murals for a, a nearby bank in order to make a living. But his paintings get eerier and eerier even though they're supposed to be something mundane like butterflies but he eventually finds as he moves into this dream house that he begins to be possessed by these satanic voices as well which start to influence his art and that's pretty much all i can say about this movie it is a movie that's very exciting to watch it's a movie that very much like the void i saw at a midnight screening and Sometimes I am completely transfixed by the movie I'm watching. Other times I'm trying to stay awake and wish I had taken a nap before watching a midnight movie. I don't think I took a nap before watching The Devil's Candy, but either way, I was really intrigued by this film, just about everything about it. I loved how original it was. I mean, the the concept of somebody moving into... a a strange house and being haunted by the spirits within them. That's been done hundreds of times in other movies, but what really sold this movie were the characters in the film, just their background, their likes and dislikes and how that led to where not only where they ended up, but also how they handled the haunted spirits in this movie and the devil's candy is a knockout in my book it's a movie as i said i hate to sound repetitive but i got about 10 minutes left so i really have to summarize here i thought everybody in this movie especially those who are haunted sold this movie and is well worth watching especially at night it only takes a minute to find out if you may have pre-diabetes and you can do it at doihaveprediabetes.org but you're probably not going to are you kids work listening to the radio you're busy Which is great, because busy people can't get prediabetes. Oh my, I read that wrong. (laughs) They can. Should have worn my glasses. So visit doihaveprediabetes.org and take a short test, because prediabetes can be reversed. Brought to you by the Ad Council and its prediabetes awareness partners. I love those real sick signs. They're the ones that move. A thinly blown neurotic tone Intensify and groove me All this and more on Unpopular Music Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and thank you for joining me to discuss my favorite topic, movies, for which I could discuss four hours, not just for one hour. But anyway, the next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is The Comedian. This is a film that just came out on DVD today, or let let me say this for the syndicated crowd. This is a movie that just came out recently on may 2nd and it stars robert de niro who who, unlike in the king of comedy is actually playing a well-established comedian in this movie so it's a look at the life of aging insult of an aging insult comic named jack burke so i gotta mention something about this name yes my name is dan burke but and 
Actually, my, my father's name is Jack Burke. But what irritates me about the name Jack Burke in this movie is that Robert De Niro plays a Jewish-American comedian with the, bir- with the birth name Yakov Berkowitz. And he makes a joke about Yakov sounding like Jackoff, ho, ho, ho. But what really irritated me is not the fact that his name was shortened to Burke. Actually, that does kind of irritate me because you hear all the time about Jewish actors and comedians who have rather long names, and they're sh- and when they become famous, their names become shortened and more anglicized. What I hate about the name Berkowitz being shortened to Burke is that Burke is not an anglicized name. It might be partially anglicized, but speaking from personal experience, it's not just Anglo-Saxon. There's also some Celtic influence in there. So that's one thing that irritates me. Another thing is the character in this movie is distinctively Jewish, or at least he's supposed to be because his his birth name is Yakov Berkowitz, but Robert De Niro is not a Jewish American. He's Italian-American. And this shouldn't irritate me or irk me in any way, but it is telling that his brother in the movie, who goes by the name of, I almost got it, Jimmy Berkowitz, is played by Danny DeVito. So you have two actors, Robert De Niro and Danny DeVito, who are clearly Italian-American, and you can tell that by their last names alone, and here they're playing... Jewish Americans. I didn't quite understand that that choice of casting. It's not that... Let me just say this. I think the characters should have been rewritten to be Italian-American and not, and not Jewish. Because these are two actors who are clearly not Jewish. And you could certainly tell that by their names alone. And before I get into something that could potentially be seen as anti-Semitic, and I don't mean that to be because I'm not anti-Semitic at all, I I just think that if another actor, either if another actor who was more known for being Jewish, like Billy Crystal had been in this movie, I wouldn't have had as much of a problem with it. But Maybe I'll I'll just put that aside. My main problem with the comedian was the fact that Robert De Niro is playing an established comedian in this film, but he's not actually funny. I mean, unlike other non-comedians who have played comedians in other movies, and one that comes to mind is Tom Hanks in the movie Punchline, Robert De Niro just isn't that funny in this film. I, I just watched this, and I saw other people in the film, other characters in the film, react to his stand-up comedy, but they weren't particularly convincing at seeing Robert De Niro's character as being funny either. And at first, when I was listening to Robert De Niro's stand-up comedy shtick in this film, I, I did think to myself, well, maybe it's just me, but comedy is indeed subjective, and De Niro plays a a comic whose material is quite controversial. Although at the same time, the movie can't really decide whether De Niro's character is a comedian who still has a lot of influence on other stand-up comics, or if he's a has-been who played an Archie Bunker-like character in a 70s sitcom. The movie seems to take both approaches, and in pleasing everyone in that regard... The movie almost seems to please no one. As a matter of fact, speaking of Robert De Niro not being funny in this film, I found it ironic that his stand-up in The King of Comedy, where he plays a wannabe stand-up comedian, is, honest to God, funnier than anything Robert De Niro does in this film. A lot of the times he was doing his stand-up shtick, especially when he was on but not on stage, if that makes sense, I sort of thought to myself, man, shut up. And it's not because I'm a prude. It's because I really honestly didn't find him funny. I also thought that the, the movie is, is labeled a comedy, but there were certainly some dramatic elements in it. And movies about comedians, if you, if you notice this, from The King of Comedy to Mr. Saturday Night to Don't Think Twice, all excellent films in their right, have one common theme – the lives of comedians, in and of themselves, can actually be unexpectedly sad. But this movie doesn't really touch upon that. 
Instead, it, it goes from being a flat-out comedy to being a romantic comedy to back to being a drama about a, a, a struggling stand-up comic. And it doesn't really find its footing. It's totally inconsistent throughout. And you're not sure exactly whether you should feel for this Jack Burke character or if you should just dismiss him as a jerk. The movie doesn't exactly give you any good footing. In addition to that, Robert De Niro's role in this film is problematic of other comedies he's done as of late. You can see he's not at ease with being funny. And when Robert De Niro is not at ease in a comedy, it shows. It showed in all three of the Meet the Parents movies, but not so much in movies like, say, Analyze This, but certainly in Analyze That. So, comedies in which Robert De Niro has the starring role, he, he, he ruins it when he seems self-conscious. And he seemed extremely self-conscious in this film. Anytime he stepped up to the mic, he didn't seem like somebody who had made a career out of being a stand-up comic. So that's where the comedian falters, and it gets my rating of a strikeout. Again, Robert De Niro can be funny, but it's more when he's at ease with himself in movies like Analyze This or the underrated movie The Intern. When he's trying to be funny, he ultimately fails, and that's too bad. How to be a great dad in 15 seconds. Bike ride, go fish, walk in the park, phone call, milkshake, play catch, picnic, fly a kite, tell jokes, laugh, talk, read a story, tell a story, bumper car, swing set, bowling, pillow fight, cut loose, stay tight. Whew. Because the smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Call 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, which you are listening to on bostonfreeradio.com, watching on Somerville Community Access TV, or watching and listening on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's page. Either way you could join me, I'm glad you did. So that does it with the reviews for this show. Now I'm going to get into a segment called What's Coming Up Next. This is a spoken sneak preview of movies that are coming out this coming weekend. And there is one big movie that's coming out in wide release, and there are no other movies movies that are coming out in wide release. It's just this movie's coming out. There's no antithesis to it, no alternative. It's just get out of the way other movies. This one's coming in. It's the first big Mar Marvel movie of the year, but probably not the last. In fact, certainly not the last since a new Spider-Man movie's coming out. And that movie goes without saying that it is Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, which is, of course, the sequel to the unexpected Guardians of the Galaxy hit from two years ago. And it is set to the backdrop of awesome mixtape number two. And I do have to say, the mixtape um, in the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie was so good that I went out and got the CD, and I'm definitely looking forward to getting the CD when it comes out this Friday. I don't think it's out yet. But Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 continues the team's adventure as they unravel the mystery of Peter Quill's, that's uh, Chris Pratt's character's, true parentage. So the movie has a number of people coming back. Chris Pratt, as I mentioned, Zoe Saldana, Dave Bautista, Vin Diesel as the voice of Groot, Bradley Cooper as the voice of that raccoon whose name I can't remember, Michael Rooker's coming back, and also this movie features appearances from Sylvester Stallone making his first appearance in a Marvel movie, and also making his first appearance in a Marvel movie, movie excuse me, Kurt Russell. 
So I'm really excited for this film. I can't wait. Not only can I w- not wait to see it, I also can't wait to hear what the mixtape sounds like. And I think that might be a big selling point of Guardians of the Galaxy. I'm also looking forward to when Guardians of the Galaxy eventually teams up with the Avengers. But that's not coming out this year. There's another... Gar- th- there's this Guardians of the Galaxy movie. I think the new Avengers movie is coming out next year in 2018. I'm pretty excited for that one, if you can believe it. But I will definitely see Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, and you'll hear exactly what I thought about it next week. Because the, the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie was so awesome. <laughs> I, 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 I Just the more I think about it, even though I haven't seen it for two years, the more I get excited about it. And I'm probably going to watch the first film again before seeing the second film. But the other movies that are coming out this weekend are all in limited release. They might be coming out in a theater near me or you. They might not. But let's take a look at what else is coming out. One movie that's coming out is called The Lovers. It's a movie starring Deborah Winger, the Deborah Winger, and Tracy Letts, who play a long-married, dispassionate couple who are both in the midst of serious affairs. I think that means sexual extramarital affairs but on the brink of calling it quits a spark between them suddenly reignites leading them into an impulse of romance this movie might be a minor comeback for deborah winger because we haven't seen her in a while but um i might see that i don't know but if i do i'll let you know exactly what i think there's another movie coming out called the dinner which i I'm pretty sure that's coming out in a theater near me pretty soon. The movie stars Richard Gere, again, making his way through independent films. Also stars Laura Linney, Steve Coogan, and Rebecca Hall. And it's a look uh, at how far parents will go to protect their children. And it's based on a novel by Herman Koch, which I haven't read, but already the premise is short but sweet, and I'd love to see how that movie turns out. But again, I don't know how it's going to be. But I'll let you know how what I think about it, if or when I see it. Another movie that's coming out called Three Generations, which stars Naomi Watts, Elle Fanning, and Susan Sarandon, amongst other people. It's a movie about after Ray decides to transition from female to male, um, a man named Ray, Ray's mother Maggie must come to terms with the decision while tracking down Ray's biological father to get his legal consent. This sounds like a very heavy movie that has a lot of potential. And I'm not sure who Ray in this movie is. All I can see is the cast name. I assume that Elle Fanning plays Ray, but then again, maybe not. But it's always interesting to see women who are portraying transsexual men. And certainly Felicity Huffman did a great job in that in the movie Trans America. But if that movie comes across my... Desk, <laughs> my uh, my metaphoric desk. I'll see it and I'll let you know what I think. But anyway, that's all with words on film for this week. Thank you for tuning in to the Spoken Word Show dedicated to moving pictures. I am your host and movie critic Dan Burke. I am very excited for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two. But until next week, I'll see you at the movies. <laughs>